Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here tonight sharing this with you. Um, this is one of my favorite topics, so I'm definitely excited to be here. So the first question, as you can see on the screen, is why does the Catholic Church exist? So I want you to kind of keep this question in your mind um, throughout the evening as I'm talking, um, because it kind of culminates as we continue to go. So we do a lot of important things at the Catholic Church. Think about everything that we do. We help those in need spiritually and materially. We offer the sacramental life, pastoral care. We hear God's word. We worship God. We learn about God. We catechize others. We have Bible studies. We are a community. But why does the Catholic Church actually exist? So core identity is everything. I want you to think about somebody um, that is lost. Perhaps think about a person who ha has amnesia. I don't know if you've ever seen a movie with somebody that has amnesia or a show, um, and I have. And what tends to happen when they have it is they constantly are seeking to find who they are. Their core identity is that important, that they don't give up until they find the answers. So. This is because our core identity makes us who we are. The church also has a core identity, but do you know what it is? So the Great Commission. This occurred when Jesus was ascending and right before Jesus ascended into heaven in the Gospel of Matthew. He says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. So what does it mean to be commissioned? The definition of commission is the act of passing on responsibility to someone else. So Jesus, in this great commission, gave the Catholic Church this responsibility to go make disciples. So this is her core identity because it, because it is the task that Jesus gave to his church. It is the purpose of the church to go make disciples. So some additional support to understanding the church's core identity. So this is a, um, a quote from the Catechism, um, 767. The church by her very nature is missionary, sent by Christ to all nations to make disciples of them. And then also Pope Paul VI um, wrote, an, an, wrote a, um, a apostolic exhortation called Evangelization in the Modern World. He actually wrote this in 1975. And this is what he states in this. Evangelization is in fact the grace and vocation proper to the church, her deepest identity. She exists in order to evangelize. So the church's roles and ministries are varied and extensive. They include defending and teaching the faith, working for our social teachings, the corporal and spiritual works of mercy, loving our neighbor, faithfulness to our vocation, sacraments, prayer, penance, and worship of God. So let me be clear, none of these things should be seen as lesser than or separate from the call of evangelization. But the challenge is to look at all of these roles and every ministry, everything that the church does through the lens of her deepest identity, which is evangelization. The Pilgrim Church is missionary by her very nature, since it is from the mission of the Son and the mission of the Holy Spirit that she draws her origin in accordance with the decree of the Father. So this quote came from a document out of the Second Vatican Council, which was published in 1965. The document is called Ad Gentes, which means to the nations. This simply gives us more indication of the core identity of the church. So what is your role in this mission? That's the hard part, right? So this is the question that the Lord tasks each of us with and that we are tasked to figure out. By our baptism, we are each called to participate in the mission of the church. We are each called to go make disciples. 
but how? How are you called? That's a part of your own personal journey of faith to figure out exactly what it is that the Lord wants you to do to help build his great kingdom. So what God asks of our clergy is different than what he asks of us as laity. But married couples, singles, youth, children are all called to evangelize. Because if you are baptized, you are commissioned. So this is our discipleship pathway that we developed here at our parish to help provide an intentional path forward for each person, no matter where you are on the journey. So because we are each called to go deeper in our relationship with God, because he loves us. <laughs> but we are also, because God's love is so infinite, and then we are called to that universal call to holiness. So this pathway shows us that we are called to encounter God's love personally, not just as group, but as a personal love, to grow as a disciple, and then also to equip ourselves to go make disciples. But there are some things to consider in light of this pathway. So there is the bad news, and then there's the good news. I'm going to throw one term out at you tonight um, that you may have heard before, um, and it's really important, I think, as we consider our journey of faith. And it's a word we've been using more often lately um, to kind of help open up what the core gospel message is, and it's called the kerygma. I'm going to break this down a little bit by sharing um, a little bit of my own personal journey of faith and um, to see how the kerygma ties in with our call to evangelize. So 10 years ago, I definitely would not have guessed that I'd be standing in front of you guys talking about evangelization and definitely not working in this role. Um, I had faith. Um, it was a little sporadic at times. It was kind of up and down throughout the years. Um, but, and I wasn't Catholic actually yet at the time. I went through RCIA num a number of years ago. But I was surrounded by a Catholic family um, and I, actually very faithful people, but we were not in the church. So what changed for me? Well, through a series of events, some big and some small, I started to recognize that I desired a true relationship with God and then I started to become more aware of the bad news. I recognized that I was broken and that I needed a savior. I recognized deep in my soul that there was something missing, that I was actually made for more, made for a deeper relationship with God. Sure, I had faith before, but I did not have that relationship. So I opened my heart to the Lord. I invited Jesus to be at the center of my life. And over a series of months, the Holy Spirit kept inspiring more, me more and more to go deeper into that relationship. Honestly, I was truly overwhelmed by the love of God for me, but also for his love for every other person. This was my encounter with the Lord. So through this conversion, I recognized not only that Jesus is Lord, but that he is also my Savior. Because once I said yes to him, he filled my life with grace in a way that transformed everything about me how I see, how I hear, how I think. Through my yes, God had access to my heart, mind, and soul. This did not make me perfect. You can ask my kids, far from it. But my yes to God gave him the access that he needed to start transforming my life in very, actually incredible ways. So the kerygma is that very story of conversion. We were made for a relationship with God. Sin wounded that relationship. I finally became aware of my own brokenness through God's grace. Jesus actually has already came and he has come to restore this relationship. He is the bridge to the Father. But I had to say yes. I had to say yes to God's invitation and thankfully I did. And this allowed God to pour grace into my life and transform me. Have you ever heard this before? You can't give what you don't have. This has been revealed to me clearly in very concrete ways in my journey of faith. Because until I said yes to Jesus, until I opened my life to him and his plans, I was lost. Once I said yes, I understood that I am called to share this good news with those I love and also with those that God places in my life. So I want you to imagine a homeless man, as in this picture. He is starving. He's searching, he's so hungry that he just looks for food anywhere he can, including the trash. For a while, this man doesn't really care what he's eating because he's just so hungry. He fills himself up as best as he can with whatever he can to survive, right? 
But then one day, someone comes up to him and says, hey, there's a truckload of food around the corner, and it is full of delicious bread and all kinds of goodies. It's free. All you have to do is go over and take it. It is a free gift. So the man goes. He's a little skeptical, right? He goes to the truck. He sees it. He smells the bread, and it smells delicious. He's so hungry, he runs up to the truck, and he takes some. Now he knows that he's been eating trash, right? Now he recognizes it. Now he knows what his body really needs. This is what happens to a person who discovers the love of God and has a conversion. This is what happens when someone realizes that they've been filling their soul with things that will never satisfy. And what their soul really needed, of course, was God. In my own journey, I realized that I am a beggar before God. And now I am telling the other beggars where to find the food. We literally have the bread of life, the Eucharist in our church, so that's pretty easy. But until we realize that we are beggars before God and that he's the only one who can fill us, who can fill in our deepest hungers and our deepest desires, we won't be able to share the good news because you can't give what you don't have. Have you ever heard this statement, share the gospel and when necessary use words? Some people have claimed that St. Francis of Assisi has said this. Some are skeptical of that. Um, but it definitely falls short of what evangelization is about. Now, don't get me wrong. Witness matters. If we are not first good witnesses, if we are not leading lives that are inspiring, living the truth of the gospel in our day-to-day -day lives, um, if we are not really able to inspire anyone to Christianity and then to Catholicism, of course, it's not going to matter. But at some point, we have to share, we have to proclaim the good news. As St. Paul stated to the Romans, But how are men to call upon him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him who they have never heard? How are they to hear without a preacher? If you are baptized, you are called to evangelize. When I look at this picture is St. Peter and St. Paul. When I look at them, I am inspired. They were both such good witnesses, right? They lived as early Christians did in a community. They loved each other. They gave everything that they could to the Lord. But they also proclaimed the faith very clearly and with confidence. They preached the good news of Jesus. They are examples when we really read this quote here coming up from the Synod on the New Evangelization, which states, being a Christian and being church means being missionary. One is or is not. Loving one's faith implies bearing witness to it, bringing it to others and allowing others to participate in it. Faith is made stronger by transmitting it. And I can attest to that. The more I share my faith, the more it grows. It's pretty incredible. So we are also called to be missionaries in the lives that we lead right now. I love this baby. So barriers. Okay, so we all have fears. This is very natural. We can be afraid of many things in regards to evangelization. Sharing our faith can be very intimidating. I get it. But with the Holy Spirit, and that is where I'm going to really call you to lean on, it's actually pretty simple. Another barrier um, can be not really knowing our faith. Um, we won't know everything. That's never going to happen. The church has an endless depth of knowledge. But we can start to learn more and to strive to have knowledge of our faith so that we can share with others who ask questions. But we can also realize that it's okay if we don't have all the answers. There's going to be a time when somebody asks you a question about the Catholic Church or about your faith in general you don't know how to answer. And you can tell them, I don't know. All you have to do is go and look it up and then come back to them and share with them what you learned, and then you learn more. It's actually a very powerful way of learning. The other barrier is what we've kind of been talking about before, not knowing God's love for us. If we don't realize that we're beggars before the Lord and that we know where the good food is, it's going to be hard to evangelize. So there are some bad examples of evangelization out there. This guy is one of them. We can definitely evangelize in the wrong way. We do not want to be aggressive when we evangelize, but rather we want to, and most of all, build relationships with the people that God places in our lives, and slowly over time, we are able to share how God has transformed our lives, because that's what inspires people. 
So some good examples. Prayer. I can't talk about evangelization and not talk about prayer. Prayer is everything when we are called to evangelize. Because pr prayer and the sacraments are how our relationship with God develops and grows. This is our access to grace. So there's a few ways of praying that I want to point out tonight. So pray for dependence on the Holy Spirit. To succeed in any evangelization activity, I have learned I have to invite the Holy Spirit and to inspire me and to give me the words and strength that I need to evangelize. Without the Holy Spirit, I've got nothing. That's why I'm standing here tonight. Pray for those that you evangelize, those who are come to your mind that God inspires you to pray, to worry about because of their faith. Pray for them specifically. Ask God to give you the grace to share with them what you feel maybe they need to hear next. Pray with those who are suffering. Actually pray with them. Invite people to pray with you. This can be really scary and can really step out of your comfort zone, but it is a very powerful way of seeing how the Holy Spirit works. And it's actually a beautiful moment for usually for the other person. And then it grows, your own faith grows. When you step outside of your comfort zone, God will always give you what you need because he's just waiting. He's just waiting for you to go deeper. As I said earlier, build relationships of trust and accompaniment. So accompaniment is a word that we use pretty often to describe one disciple walking with another disciple. So you are there to hold them accountable in some ways, but you are also to help them grow in their faith and then you in turn grow in your faith. And then the other thing, a really good example, and this is how to evangelize, is develop your own personal testimony. So people can argue about church teachings, they can argue about our beliefs, but it is really difficult to argue with somebody's own journey of faith. Um, it's yours, you own it, they can't take that away from you. Personal testimonies are powerful because people can start to see a change in your life, and then they oftentimes, that transformation is usually inexplicable. So there's really hard to like, argue with it because it, you can see a major change, and that's the grace at work in your life. When we share our story with others in an authentic way, the Holy Spirit will work every time. Um, when it comes to sharing your personal testimony, there are usually some steps that you want to follow, three basic steps. What was your life like before this particular moment or moment of conversion? What happened in that moment that changed you? And then what is your life like now after that? So that's a really simple way. You can do that on a broad scale and you can do it for little moments throughout your life. So here are some key terms when it comes to evangelization because I think sometimes we don't even know what it is. So evangelization is sharing the good news. I added one beggar to another. And this is another quote from Pope Paul VI that I mentioned earlier. The church evangelizes when she seeks to convert. So we're really truly talking about conversion of heart. The new evangelization is another term that we've been using a lot in the church. I don't know if you've heard it. Um, Saint Pope John Paul II, he coined this term. It's really re-evangelizing the baptized. This is something we've actually been working on a lot as a parish, is providing opportunities for people to encounter Jesus in a new and unique way, even for those who have been longtime Catholics, like discovering Christ, invitation to personal prayer. I don't know if you've heard of those, but that's what we're trying to do there. So disciple. A disciple is someone who in first encounters the Lord, but then they say yes. They say yes to follow him. This does not mean a person is perfect. When a person says yes to being a disciple, it does not mean perfection. That's actually the opportunity to start growing as a faithful disciple um, with the grace that God gives because we said yes. This is really important. I think sometimes we think discipleship means perfection, and it does not. There's also the term missionary disciple, which Father actually mentioned in his prayer. So a missionary disciple is somebody who is a committed disciple. They are following Jesus Christ. He, they, he, they have made him the Lord and center of their life. But then they also share the good news that they have personally experienced. So we can be disciples, but not necessarily missionary disciples. So this um, quote from 1 Peter, I think, really says it clearly. Always be ready to give an explanation to anyone who asks you for a reason for your hope but do it with gentleness and reverence. Okay, so this final image um, represents what we might see when we enter heaven. 
I really like to think about this when, I evan when I'm thinking about evangelization, especially when I'm stepping outside of my comfort zone and I'm feeling a little scared. Because one day we will meet Jesus face to face, right? That is what our Christian hope is. And I really like to imagine that day, and I like to imagine what Jesus will say to me. Um, it helps keep me on the right path also. So I also picture the people that I have shared my faith with. I picture the ones that I planted seeds of faith. I picture the ones who I've really poured into and accompanied along the way. This has helped me to really imagine how much and how important this is, this work is for the, for the kingdom of God. So to evangelize, it actually is a great gift. It is not a burden when we start to realize that we are simply beggars, sharing with other beggars where the food is. And once we encounter God's love and we grow as his disciples, we can start to discern where God is calling us to help him evangelize the world. Once I encountered Jesus, my heart burned to share this good news. If your heart does not burn to share this yet, that's okay. Ask God to place this desire within you. I promise you, he will respond. This quote will tell you why from Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. The Lord needs you. He needs all of us to help him. The world needs us. The faithful, we all need to share the good news, help people to discover what their heart really longs for and is not what the world has to offer, but rather the Lord, of course. As St. Augustine said, you made us for yourself, O Lord, and our heart is restless until it finds rest in you. It's been a blessing to share with you a little bit tonight. I thank you and I hope you have a good evening. <laughs>